We're 10 years on from one of Formula One's great fairy tale stories when Braun GP rose from the ashes of Honda and won both world championships with Jensen Button, the driver's champion, and Braun taking the constructor's title. It's a story that still resonates to this day with fans, and the Braun is still loved by a lot of the F1 community. In fact, when Codemasters makes the official F1 games, they've always had the Braun as the most requested classic car, and last year it finally appeared in F1 2018. And our own 3D animation team are currently working on a special project all about the car, which we'll be able to watch soon. But how special really was the Braun? I've got Stuart Codling and Ed Straw here to discuss how it should be remembered and how good it was at the time. And Codders, I'm coming to you first. The Braun's brilliant, isn't it? Great car, but this wasn't a fairy tale success. It was one of the most expensive Formula One cars of all time, the result of uh, 300 million pound a year spent by Honda, three separate wind tunnel programs operating concurrently, three design teams, and they basically threw every idea they had at the wall and whatever stuck they, uh, they used. And, and while they were doing that, all the other teams throughout 2008 were fighting each other, so they had a free run. So that is my contention. It's not Leicester City winning the Premier League, it is the result of an awful lot of money being spent with one goal and they almost lost it. Does that mean, Ed, that this isn't the perhaps underdog story that has been portrayed as for the last decade? Well, I think, Collins, I think you've missed the point there, really. This is a, sport is a human endeavour, isn't it? Yes, Formula One's a technical endeavour, but the car you see there, the Braun, it was the efforts of hundreds of people. Now, they were told early December, the rug was pulled out from under them, Honda's pulling out. They didn't know they'd have jobs, they didn't know they had a team to work for, the drivers didn't know what was going on, you know, Button thought his career might be pretty much done and he was being given one potential get-out offer by Toro Rosso, that's how uh, desperate, <laughs> desperate things had, had got. He graciously took a pay cut to stay at He Brown, certainly did, he? he certainly did. So, for me, everything you say is correct, but I think that's not the reason it resonates with people. That car did not run until, I think it was, uh, it was early March, wasn't it, 9th of March the car first ran, it only did... 3,200 odd kilometres of testing pre-season. Even going to Australia, I remember, we weren't completely sure that it wasn't an illusion what we'd seen because there were all sorts of uh, question marks over it. So I think it's about a team that was nothing. And yet all these circumstances happened. Yes, money was put in. Yes, they had some advantages. But they got to the first race having not known they were going to get there. They then got through the season on a reduced budget. They had to cut 270 people out of the team. They didn't restructure as they went along. So it was a real, a real effort. Even though all that money had been put into the car, the actual circumstances of how they ran it, the human story, the emotion that went into it, is what elevates the Braun story to something that really resonates with people. You couldn't be sure it was going to be on the grid six weeks before. And yet there it was, winning in Australia, 1-2, winning the championship. It is a great story. For me, one of the most remarkable stories is the cynicism of Formula One people. So you, you have this car actually pulling out of the garage in Barcelona for the first time in that test, having arrived late. And within a couple of laps, it's very obvious to the people pointing big lenses at it around the circuit that it is way ahead of all the other cars. So the photographers put down their big lenses, pick up their phones, get on the blower to the bookmakers back home and start placing bets on Jensen for the championship. Lo and behold, that eventuates. But then as, as part of the underdog narrative we love so much, it kind of hits the buffers mid-season, doesn't it? Because although the car is a fantastically expensive research project, it's also partly a lash up because they had to shoehorn a Mercedes engine in there and there was a, an off-site in, offset rather in the crank heights between the engine that was supposed to go in there and the Mercedes engine. So it was fun fundamentally flawed in terms of its uh, weight distribution and handling and yet it was still so much quicker than the other cars. Ed, do you think that actually that engine change perhaps worked for Braun? Because I've heard in the past arguments that the Honda engine was nothing special in 2008 and potentially if this car had been powered by a Honda engine as it was supposed to be instead of the Mercedes which was arguably the leading V8 at the time they might not have actually won the championship as Honda. I think there's a good chance they wouldn't have done. I think if Honda had continued and it had been a Honda Works team, we might have, might have said, well, that was a great step forward. They won a few races. Isn't that brilliant? But we wouldn't have had this, this amazing story. But I think the, the key is that, as you, as you were saying, Codders, they ha did have to lash up the car. There were limitations on it. They were struggling with tyre warm, that kind of thing over the season. The other important thing is, ultimately, it wasn't the team's fault that Jensen Button tightened up. You know, he admitted... He was struggling a bit. He won six of the first seven races. Then the next ten, he was on, only on the podium twice 
And one of those was after he clinched the championship because he, he sealed it at, at Interlagos. And I think it's all these elements that make it such a great story. Button described it as a fairy tale after winning Australia because he'd lived it those months of just uncertainty. They knew they had this fantastic car that they'd basically written off the whole of 08, effectively, to focus on, and it all been ruined, basically, but they managed to get the car up and running and have a success. They went through the season, I think it was three chassis, the whole thing. They weren't particularly well blessed with parts. Upgrades were difficult to come. Yeah, you had all the political backdrop, the double diffuser, etc., which was a ideally an idea that originally came from Japan, actually. Sometimes it's credited to Super Aguri, but it was a, an aero group in Japan. I think Ross Braun described it as an advanced conceptual program. So that was where that original idea for double diffuser, which I won't get into now, but it's... Well, let, let's briefly get into it, yeah. because there was a lot of controversy around... This is from the Australian Grand Prix, this picture, and the controversy was ongoing at that point. Was the double diffuser an ingenious exploitation of a loophole or is, was it allowed through politics and everything else that was going on in F1 at the time? We know that Red Bull, for example, who arguably had what they considered the best conventional car at the start of 2009, furious about the double diffuser and had to do a real massive B-spec upgrade of their car to properly accommodate one once it was fully legal. So was that ingenuity from Braun or were they lucky that it was allowed through the rules? I think it was a little bit of both. Uh, <laughs> uh, Adrian Newey in his autobiography does say that it was a Max Mosley stitch up to punish McLaren and Ferrari who didn't have double diffusers. Um, but something we should bring in is that Braun weren't, weren't the only team to have identified that loophole. Williams and Toyota uh, had double diffusers as well. And, and I think maybe we, people have been a little bit guilty at, at, as uh, for looking at that as perhaps a, a game changer in and of itself, whereas what made the Braun such a quick car was they'd designed it as a complete package and they'd also sussed the potential of the outwash front wing a much, to a much greater degree than Toyota and Williams had, which is why uh, the car worked so well. It's not one part making the car that much quicker. But again, it, it comes back to this fact of that they had three wind tunnel programs going. They had the two at Brackley, because you could have as many tunnels as you wanted in those days. They had, I think they were the, it was the dome uh, wind tunnel in Japan that came, where they came up with the, the double diffuser idea. So, so they literally were able to evaluate all these different concepts and junk the ones that didn't work to an extent that nobody else could. But every fairy tale does need its bad guy, the hooded claw, or in our case, Max Mosley. So, uh, you know, the, the, there's no doubt really in my mind that there was an element of Max Mosley stitch up uh, in, in allowing it through, and it probably should have been banned. But we should say, Toyota was spending a huge amount of money, didn't yeah. win a race that year. They weren't the only team that was, that was doing this kind of thing. I know they took it maybe to, to an extreme, but the, the whole thing was, it was the culmination of the efforts of the team. I think if you were one of those people who was there, who was working on it all of 2008, thought you were done for, and then you were one of those people who was either with the team for the rest of the year or one of those maybe unfortunate ones who had to be laid off at the start of the year, you'd be looking at that and seeing it in a completely different light. And that's what resonates with people. The fans, for the most part, don't care about the, the story of the wind tunnel time and aero groups and this, that and the other and the political background, et cetera, et cetera, and they don't care about definitions of holes and whether, whether it's a space between transitions, I think was the, was the FI verdict, because to allow the double diffuser, you have a reference plane, which is most of the car floor, and then there's a, a step plane at the back, and there's a gap between them, so there's your we'll transition. We'll stick a drawer in over that bit to try and help explain it. <laughs> it's, yeah. not, it's not these things. Yes. But, but this is what it is. It's, it's a, it is a human story. That car might not have been on the grid, and it was, and it won, and it secured the championship, even though, yeah, the Red Bull was the better car overall that year, that Braun was able to survive all the cutbacks, all the difficulties, the, the lash up, as you put it, elements of it, is what makes this so so enduring. And I think people will always look back at Braun as as a one-off. The circumstances were extraordinary. Really, there's no there's not actually any such thing as fairy tales. Things don't happen by magic. There's reasons why things happen. But this was a team in a state of flux that did something remarkable that Perhaps it shouldn't have done. If they'd won one race and finished fourth in the Constructors' Championship, you said, well, that was a good effort. But they won. They won the Drivers and the Constructors' Championship. What a story. We won't see a story like that again. So there you have it. Two different arguments about the Braun and whether it was a great fairy tale story or just a result, as always in F1, it seems, of massive investment from a manufacturer. Who's right out of Codders and Ed? We're going to let you decide. Please let us know.